game. Blouses. Gallon Chuck. Disaster. I forget it. Disaster. Well, I mean, I'm no doctor. We now join America's most popular show already in progress. Everybody loves Mitch and Sean. You guys are the greatest duo. Woo! Fantastic. That team sure did suck last night. They just played sucked. I've seen teams suck before, but they were the suckiest bunch of sucks that ever sucked. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Post Game Pints podcast with myself, Mitch Gallo, and Sean Campbell. We're brought to you by LaBrosse Brewery and Cunningham's Pub, and glad to be with you, Sean, for episode number 92. Coming up on episode 92, we will have, of course, the rapid fire to kick us off, talk about uh, Jeff Petrie, and if he's on his way out of Montreal, uh, we'll have soup and wine. I'll complain, and Campbell will give you a warm heartfelt story and uh, finally we always wrap up with the pop quiz sean episode 92 yeah what what do you think about when you think the number 92 like what do you what do you what do you think about like a sports wise or number wise what's what's 92 in your mind look i, I knew you're gonna ask me yes uh, you also know i'm not necessarily I a know. numbers guy i i i can't think of really anybody look what what number did Joe Juno wear with Montreal? Joe Juno, I believe he was 90, 90 or ninety one. Okay, I knew it was a ninety two. It was a ninety two. It was a ninety two. Yeah. What number did Joe Juno wear? Let us know. Was it ninety or ninety one? I think it was ninety one with the Canadians for Joe Juno. Or was it ninety? He was ninety. No, I know it was a number like that. Yeah, but it was a ninety two. It was a ninety two. No, 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 I no. can give you some ninety threes and ninety fours, but not this yeah. week. Uh, what about Gabriel Ladinskog? Okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's 92, right? That's a good one. You know, the best 92, though. Packers fans, though. Who wore 92 for the Packers? The Reverend, Reggie White. Reggie White. Reggie White. How long, how, Reggie, how, long was he in, how long was he in Green Bay for? Well, uh, he won the Super Bowl in 96 with Green Bay. Uh, he finished his career there, and uh, he had he was so good. There you go. There we go. <laughs> we love it. Love it. It was 90. It was 90. 90. Oh, yeah. Uh, 32 coming up with that one. That is awesome. Uh, yeah, so he wore 92, and he was with the Eagles for so long, and then he moved. And everybody thought he was kind of done after the Eagles because, you know, those defensive is an older guy, but he was yeah. so good with the Packers helping them uh, to that Super Bowl. So uh, I'm going Reggie White. Reggie White, 92. That's my number. All right. Let me just see here, Sean. Uh, number 92 to play for the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, only two players. Okay. Uh, and one of them we should have got pretty easily. Mm-hmm. He's on the uh, team now. All right. Jonathan Drouin. Mm-hmm. And uh, the other one, Steve Ott. Steve Ott. The only two Montreal Canadiens everywhere 92. Oh, man. Sergio hated Steve Ott. Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so why don't we start with the Canadians here, and let's get to the rapid fire. A lot of stuff happening around the Habs. I want to talk a little NFL, too, and, and get into some hockey stuff. We'll have a pop quiz later on here on the post game pints. But, I mean, the biggest question, Mitch, around the Canadians is what to do with Jeff Petrie. I, I will tell you this. I've been so patient. I'm like, okay, he'll turn it around. Jeff Petrie, it, it, it's, you know, he's going to be okay just give him some time. He needs time with his family over the holidays. Oh, getting COVID was the best thing. He's going to have a break. The Olympic break is going to be awesome. He'll be back to where he was. And every time I watch Jeff Petrie now, and I'm like, stay strong. He's going to be good. Stay strong. And then I get disappointed every time I watch. It's 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 frustrating to watch him play knowing how good he is. Well, I think what's what's most frustrating is how good he was just six months ago. Think back to the Stanley Cup playoffs and where the Canadians would have been without a guy like Jeff Petrie. And think about, you know, the sacrifice and the pain he had to go through to to get uh, into that series with the uh, Vegas Golden Knights. I mean, he really sacrificed a lot. And Mm -hmm. uh, I think Canadian fans should appreciate that. 
I also think sometimes uh, you just need a change of scenery. And this is a very complicated uh, issue with um, him and his wife clearly not happy with some of the COVID mandates uh, in Quebec. Um, you know, they worry about their children and they want their children uh, to be able to have a mm. normal upbringing, which right now in Quebec, it's been challenging at times to say the least. And his mind just doesn't seem to be in the right place when he's playing. And if you're not totally invested both mentally and emotionally in a, in a hockey game, you're going to see um, the house of cards fall. Yeah. And I think we've seen that with Jeff Petrie. So what are they going to do with Petrie? Campbell, in my mind, they have no choice but to trade him. But I also don't think they have to rush into trading him this very instant. Like, you can hold off until you get a deal that you think can make your team uh, better in the future. I don't if think you, you have to do this immediately. Yeah. And I think it might even make a lot more sense to do this in the summer when teams are a little bit more flexible with their salary cap situations. Uh, but... Uh, long story short, I'm sorry, Sean, but as much as I know you like and appreciate Jeff Petrie, I think it's best for both parties to move on at this point. And I'm fine with that. I, I think, you know, watching and witnessing what's going on with the Canadians, that's OK. But Kent Hughes's first move can't be getting fleeced in a Jeff Petrie deal because he feels he has to get him off the roster like he can't do that. So it's it's it, to me, you have to be cautious. You have to be patient. You're going to yeah. have to wait this out. You're going to have to try and pump his tires a little bit and say, Jeff, take it easy. Go out there, play your game. We'll get you on the power play. Just some sort of confidence. Because it seems like they're trying, but nothing is working. And you you could try yourself on the outside if it's not working within him. And he's already checked out himself, which it looks like. And I don't want to call out Jeff Petrie because I, I think professional athletes are, you know, they go out there and they try their best. And I, you know, it's just not working for him right now. You, you spoke, Mitch, you, you, you spoke about six months ago, a year ago, we were talking about how Jeff Petrie was the best defenseman in Canada with the, with the start of the season that he had offensively, defensively. That was a year ago, six months ago, he was in the Stanley Cup final. Like how far removed is he from that player? So when you're trying to trade him, yeah, you got to point to there. You can't point to anything that's happening this season. So in my mind, Jeff, you know, like figure it out. And for the Canadians' sake, they can't rush a deal. Ken Hughes' first major trade can't be getting fleeced on a deal. Remember, Mark Berger's first deal was pretty much bringing in Jeff Petrie, and everyone was like, oh, what a deal. It would be like the reverse if he got rid of him for a fifth and a sixth-round draft pick or a, yeah. a, a prospect that no one cares about. So, yeah, trading and moving on may be the best answer, but don't rush into it. Yeah, and and let's not forget here, uh, Petrie also holds a 15 15- team no trade clause yeah. uh, which also complicates things when you can only deal with money too. Uh, with 16 other teams uh next up on the rapid fire sean bye jeff dominic ducharme what mm. do the canadians do with that situation because man oh man he seems like he's out of answers yeah this is i kind of look at this too right so kent Hughes' his first deal what if it's jeff petrie does he get fleeced and then if they decide to get rid of dominic ducharme the first thing that people are going to say is Jeff Gordon said he was there till the end of the season. He's a liar. Now I understand things happen, things but change. Yeah. It, things change, but there's a couple things that I think there's a reason why he stays one. They're already paying two coaches. You want to pay three. You want to pay three. They're already paying two. Yep. You want to pay three. Okay. So that's, that's a financial thing with a team that has an empty building. You're in last place. Does it really matter if you're, you know, I know you're, he's going to try his best, but maybe it's just not working. And the other thing is, you know, Jeff Gordon doesn't want to be a liar. He said he was going to stay. Who's available right now to take over? Even on an interim basis. Sure, Luke Richardson, Alex Burrows. No, just let him finish the season. And if you really hate what you hate, no. Or let him finish the season and say, Dominic, you got 38 games to prove something to us. And if you do... We're going to sit down and honor your contract. We like you. But, man, you got to do something. You're on. I'd, I'd warn him. I'd warn him. I'd say, hey, Dominic, right now, doesn't look good. Maybe that's not good for him. I don't know. But at the same time, I'd, I kind of warn him, say, you need to do something here with this team. I don't care what the roster looks like. You need to look like you know what you're doing or we're going to change things. But I'd wait. I'd wait this season. 
There's yeah, no, there's no, see, there's no so options. There's nothing I've, to do. I've, I've gone back and forth on this. I just, I, I really believe that if Dominic Ducharme uh, becomes a uh, triple D, then you have to make a change. When I say triple D, I mean Dominic Ducharme detrimental. Yeah. If, he, if he's gonna, if he's hurting the team in the long term, then I really think you have to cut the cord. I like Dominic Ducharme. I think he's a good coach. I think this is a tough situation. But some of the things, Sean, both that he has said and he has done have not made much sense. Like when I look at Ryan Paling's ice time and I see him playing seven minutes a game and then I see Laurent Dauphin up around the 13, 14, 15 minute mark with where the Canadians are in the standings. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have a hard time understanding that. You know, when, when they get beat 7-2... Mitch, two, Mitch, that's second guessing. When he, when they get beat 7-2, to two, Sean, and he's asked about the effort level of the team, and he says, well, McDavid didn't get a point. They only got 24 shots and 12 scoring chances. Yeah. What game were you watching? Because... Well, that to me, when he I said that, watching, I know everybody was, was mad about that. I was like, he is throwing his goalies under the bus. I mean, that's, that's the other yeah. way. Yeah, for sure. That's the other and, way. And, of and the goalies, it. let's be honest, deserve to be thrown under the bus the way they've been playing. And I know they're not NHL goalies, but still, you got to, it, it's a huge factor. What the first three shots of the game go in, even if they're good shots and you're not playing good defense, you need a save every now and then. And yeah, you need a save. I, you know, I thought the goaltending was worse in the Columbus game than the one he threw them under the bus. Yeah. I also think those goaltenders. We're making 50 saves a game, Sean, which I don't know what other team lets up that many shots. Yeah. And, you know, r regardless of not getting a save, I don't think defending the team's effort level in that game was well suited. I don't think it really told the story. That yeah. team did lack effort. And when the goalies let up a few softies, they checked out. And everybody knows right now with the Montreal Canadiens. Every team that comes to the Bell Center or every team that welcomes the Canadians to yeah. their rink knows that if you jump on them in the first 10 minutes of the game and score early, you can have a night off. You could have a night of rest. You can look forward to the rest of your road trip or the rest of your homestand because the game's over in the first period. And to me, that's unacceptable. And I understand why you're saying they should be patient here and they don't have to rush into a move. And I've always said, when, you, when you're a general manager, you only have so many bullets. And why would Ken Hughes fire off a bullet so early in his tenure? Sean, it's just, it's, it's, it's that bad at this point. Right? Yeah. I don't think they necessarily have to bring in the full-time head coach of this team. But it might be best to just get rid of and get this guy away from the team right now. Yeah, but here's the other thing, and I'll, and, and I'll, and I'll try and defend Dominic Ducharme as best I can because I, I want to preach patience. He hasn't been a coach for a year yet. Like, it hasn't been a year. And, I, and, and we saw when it works, it works very well with what he wants to do because we saw it in the Stanley Cup Finals. A different roster, I get that. But out of the 45 games that the Canadians have played this year, 44, 45 games, okay, how many times did they have a legitimate NHL roster? The, this is on the previous general manager, general manager they have on COVID, whatever. But ballpark it, 10, 12, 13 out of 45 games. And I know that they only have eight wins and we can throw excuses on the side. But I'm like, man, I just want to see this team when they're health. Like they're still not healthy. And I know every team doesn't get healthy, but this is like devastating. Yeah, Sean, Sean, you're not you're not wrong. But I'll also tell you, I feel like they're getting worse as they get healthier. I, I get it because I think it's a trickle-down effect to what was happening earlier. I also think the veterans might not care as much as they should right now. Yeah, and if they were healthy at the beginning, and then maybe they'd have 50, like whatever. They still wouldn't be great. But I'm just, it's like 12 games you had an NHL roster and you're going to blame the coach. The coach has to deal with what he's had to deal with. All right. Uh, you want to switch things up here a little bit and sure. go to uh, the NFL? We have a Super Bowl set. And it's not the Super Bowl that many people had before the season started. Uh, I was expecting the NFC to be represented by the Big G. Did not happen. It's not represented by the Big T. Tom Brady. Did not happen. It's the Rams, who uh, I think you and I both like the Rams. I know how, how you feel about the Rams. They look weird this season. They figure it out coming into the playoffs. Matthew Stafford has found a way to win in the playoffs. And then in the AFC, Bills, Chiefs. 
uh, you know, whoever you want to look at, the Ravens were number one at eight ten, and three. Ten, Tennessee. Tennessee, the number one seed. And here comes Joe Burrow and the Bengals. And I, I'm excited for the Bengals. I'm excited for the career of Joe Burrow. He just looks like he's so much fun. I'm disappointed that we're not going to see Mahomes. I'm a big fan of watching Kansas City play, sure. but good on the Bengals. Good on the NFL for keeping sports uh, exciting. And we have the Bengals versus the Rams. I don't know your first initial reaction when you figured out that this was a Super Bowl. Well, Sean, uh, as you know, I picked the Rams in the NFC. So I'll pat myself on the back. I just uh, and, and, and I know probably uh, you would have had the Rams a little bit higher than you did if you didn't have a, a, a disbelief in Matt Stafford, which I think you have now um, made amendment. And, yeah, he's and, and he's, he's like, slowly he, Tim Thomas seen it. He's slowly and and I and I by the way and just on this Matthew Stafford thing, I have said this. I was waiting for him to show me something because every time I saw something from him, he turned into the Detroit Lions Matthew Stafford that everything fell apart. And we, I knew how good his arm was, how good a quarterback he is, and I saw it through the year through the season with the Rams. But at the same time, I was like, "Yeah, let's show me when it yeah. when it counts." And, you know, and, I, I, and through the playoffs, he's he's shown me. I'm. I think I think your mind uh, might have been corrupted by him playing for a very bad team that played in the same division mm -hmm. as the team you cheer for. Sure, and but I was would, open to change, and I said would, I want to watch him, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm impressed with Matthew Stafford in the playoffs. You know, you now give him uh, a couple weapons. You know, great chemistry with Cooper Cup, and a, a guy that I think is a football genius in Sean McVay. Mm -hmm. And everything's really come together for Matt Stafford. But look, uh, this is a team that I like mostly uh, because of their defense, not their offense. Their offense now has been good enough to get them to the Super Bowl, where I think it may have been an issue in years past when they had Jared Goff there at quarterback. But, you know, with Aaron Donald and Vaughn Miller and then mm -hmm. Jalen Ramsey, like you have the ability to neutralize quarterbacks with your D-line play and take away the other team's top receiver with one of the best cover corners in the league. I think it's going to be a very difficult Super Bowl for the uh, Cincinnati Bengals. I think that the offensive line in Cincinnati has shown to have holes, and I wonder how the Rams are going to be able to exploit that. I love the story of Joe Burrow. I don't know if there's a receiver right now in the league that I like watching more and than uh, Jamar Chase, who is having and had the rookie season for ages. So the, the Super Bowl, I think, I like the matchup. I'm surprised uh, that Cincinnati's there. But, the, Sean, I, I think both these teams are pretty easy to, to cheer for. And, you know, for the first time in a long time, we're going to see uh, one of the two teams in the Super Bowl play in their home stadium. And I think that's really cool as well and will add to the atmosphere and ambience that we're going to watch on a Super Bowl Sunday. Didn't Tom I, Brady I, do I, that I, last year? What's that? Wasn't it in Tampa last year? Uh, Yes. Okay pretty sure it was in tampa or or am i thinking of wrestlemania i don't know wrestlemania was definitely in tampa it may have been in tampa uh last year i don't I mean, know florida was the only thing open last year in february <laughs> that's, that's uh that's very true um but I, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh to the whole thing hopefully with as good as um the nfc championship afc championship games were and of course yeah. how good the games in the divisional round were hopefully the super bowl is not a letdown well, shout out to Simon Salikas, who after the uh, divisional round, uh, those crazy games that went down to the wire, everything, he goes, if the Super Bowl's a dud, remember this weekend. And then I, I was thinking the same thing on championship weekend. If the Super Bowl's a dud, remember this weekend too, because of how the journey of how the, everybody got there and what the Bengals did. And if they get blown out or if the Bengals and Joe Burrow goes and scores five touchdown passes against this Rams defense, and everyone's like, Joe Burrow is the next, Tom Brady, he's the greatest quarterback to ever live. Um, I'm looking forward to it. I think this is going to be a fun Super Bowl. I have zero rooting interest, except for maybe we're going to throw some prop bets out there and have some fun with it. I'm just, I, I have, I'm just looking for a good time. The NFL has done that to me for someone that was really disappointed with the way it started with my team one and done, as you can tell. But I have not missed a game. I could have shut her down and hid in the corner of my couch. But I didn't because the NFL has been amazing. So I, I have nothing. 
but uh, high expectations for the Super Bowl. So uh, I will, we'll save our picks for another show because we still have yeah. a lot of time. But uh, yeah, that was good. So that's our rapid fire here on the Post Game Pints podcast. Campbell, Gallo. Uh, we haven't done this in a long time, Mitch. Soup and wine. And what is how, how does this work, soup and wine? Hey, soup. Soup Campbell. <laughs> Of Mitchie, course, where are you, Mitchie? Where are you? Of, of course, uh, Campbell is the soup. I am the wine, uh, Gallo and Campbell. How's this going to work? Uh, I am going to bring up a story that I want to whine about, mm -hmm. and Campbell will bring up a, a warm story, something that uh, should make you feel good. Yeah, good for the soul, right? Isn't yeah. that what it is? Yeah. So you you want me to start this time around? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, Sean. Uh, I want to rant a little bit here about Major League Baseball. Jeff Passan reporting that it's likely the MLB season gets delayed. Doesn't start on time. Shocking. Sean, enough is enough. And it's time for a change. I think somebody very wise said that many years ago. I, 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 I just, I don't understand how they can continue to mess with fans the way they do. I don't think this should be an easy uh, negotiation. I think some of the things you have to worry about here uh, service time and the way it's manipulated right now by the owners, uh, rule changes to make the game faster. Uh, arbitration is definitely something that they're going to have to battle over postseason expansion. There's a long laundry list of items for the two sides to try to iron out, but it shouldn't result in a delay. And we see this with all labor negotiations. We're going to get together a little bit. We're going to talk mm -hmm. and then we're going to break away. We're going to be pissed off at each other. And then we'll draw up this date. And this date is uh, May 18th. And then everything is cut off until that date. And you need these self-imposed deadlines that don't mean anything. But all they do is put pressure points on the negotiations when the negotiations should get out of the way much sooner. It's like they need, and this is not just Major League Baseball, but they're the worst when it comes to this stuff but they need like these pressure points to get a deal done when there is obviously going to be a resolution. So if I know there's going to be a resolution and you know, there's going to be a resolution, why can't we get to a resolution sooner so that the fans don't have to suffer and lose out on what should be a 162 game season? Sean, I am fed up. I am fed up with major league baseball and how this happens time and time again. Oh, you did this before and before and before, including the 1994 season, a big reason why there's no more team in my city and Major League Baseball. As a fan, you want to upset me even more. Tell the Montreal Baseball Project that there's potential for a split city. There's potential for a split city. There's a potential for a split city. And then out of nowhere, pull the rug out and say, no, not happening. No split city. And I think the, the, the thing that is most disappointing the saddest thing about it is as much as i rant and as much as baseball fans are pissed off when the first pitch is thrown on opening day like a bunch of idiots we're all gonna come streaming back in and watch as if nothing happened selfish owners selfish players i'm fed up yeah but you say you're gonna come back because i know you're a baseball fan and i'm gonna keep it but i'll tell you the casual baseball fans they're 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 keeping them away right now they're there, there's so many other sports that are drawing them in. We see what's happening to the NBA, MLS, soccer, and uh, it, it coming into North America. And baseball's demographic, I mean, they're not appealing to that younger generation. And they're not marketing their stars very well. And Fair, fair, this, fair critiques. Fair and, critiques. And, sure. and they're, this, this, you know, negotiations over millions and billions of dollars, it only makes the fans you know, care so much less. And there's so many more options out there. And the ge next generation that they need to bring in has a short attention span. Mitch, you know that. I know that. Like, it just, they're not doing a good job and they're just sitting there arguing around millions. I'm, I'm with you. And I think that this one, we saw the negotiations through COVID and how bad that was. I think this one's, if they delay the season, this one's going to really hurt baseball. Really, really bad. I think so. All right, I'm going to give you my, uh, my, my soup. Because I know that you were a little angry. I want to make you feel a little bit better. And I want to, I, I don't know, I just want to talk about a story that maybe didn't get enough light around the National Hockey League. Because I think this is an amazing feat. 
and that's Keith Yandel breaking the Iron Man streak. I and and maybe it's because it's Keith Yandel, random NHL player. You know, is he a superstar? No, this is just he's played in the, he's played in the uh, All Star game a couple times, and he's gotten out there, and he's been uh, you know a journeyman from different organization to another one, and you know always oh, contracts too much in Florida. He almost sat out a game because he wasn't part of the top six. I get all that, but through thick and thin, he showed up every single game, and. The accomplishment to break a record that's been sitting since the 80s. Since the 80s, Mitch. Mitch, wait, what decade were you born? I was born in the 80s. You were born in the 80s. This guy played in the 70s and I'm and, and breaking Doug Jarvis, uh, his record for consecutive games in a sport like the National Hockey League, and it's still continuing. I mean, I got to tip my cap. Hey, and how about this? Keith Yandel. Hasn't missed a game because of COVID either. He's been able to get through COVID. Like yeah, that's, that's amazing. Ridiculous. Yeah. Right. Yeah, like yeah. Andrew Cogliano, his streak ended because he got suspended. He you can't get suspended. You can't miss COVID. Like, and everybody gets COVID. It's insane. So I just to me, uh, I just want to tip my cap and I feel like it needs a little bit uh, more recognition to what kind of record this is. Like I get it. It's not Cal Ripken Jr. and and, and baseball, but baseball is a different sport than hockey. It's not Brett Favre in the quarterback position in the National Football League at 200. But this is 960 now, seven games in a row for Keith Yandel at this point. He might hit a thousand games consecutively. Mind boggling, Mitch. Mind boggling. Yeah. So I just tip my cap to Keith Yandel. Uh, continue doing what you're doing, Mr. Journeyman, Mr. Oh, you're not good enough. No, no, you, you deserve everything that you're getting right now, because that is a feat upon itself to stay in the national hockey league that long. Like, I mean, a career at 900 games long itself is amazing. Yeah. You know what? I, I think it's so impressive and, you know, also just the respect from his teammates. I think you mentioned, hmm. uh, when he was almost healthy scratched, well, it's because his teammates uh, went up to the coaching staff and yep. said, "No, can't you this. can't, you can't do this to him." Just think, Sean, uh, the 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 grind that is the NHL, and you know how how he must have been banged up at times. Some of the things he had to sacrifice in order to play. Like I I I, I love those attendance records. You know, I, I'm I'm impressed with what Phil Kessel has been able to do. Mm-hmm. I was impressed with uh, Andrew Cogliano before he missed the game with suspension. Heck, I, I look at Patrick Marlowe and the games played. Yeah. Uh, Joe Thornton, just like these guys are incredible for uh, their longevity and how they're able to suit up uh, every single night. And Keith Yandel, obviously, uh, at the top of the list because of the record that he was going to be able to break. I, I, I like when records get broken. I thought that one was uh, not going to be broken, Sean. I thought Doug yeah. Jarvis was always going to have uh, the record for, for Ironman. And I still think, you know, the Cal Ripken 2,632 is going to stand forever in major yeah. League baseball. Now players always get days off. Just imagine uh, what it must have taken for Cal Ripken to suit up and play at a high level, winning an MVP uh, and do it every single day uh, mm-hmm. with the, that grueling baseball schedule. So yeah, when, when you're talking about uh, guys that, you know, get themselves up and ready night in and night out, there's no way you can snicker or frown or say anything bad about the record that Keith Yandel was able to set. All right, so on that note, it's time for a pop quiz, Mitch Gallo. All right. And uh, things have changed in the National Hockey League. And I know you mentioned another name, but because of the consecutive Ironman streak, I want to know if you can name the top six. You know the top two. I heard you name them. Ironman active in the National Hockey League. I will tell you this with COVID and injuries, there are only six players to have a streak higher than 300 games. Only yeah. six players. Yeah. See, I only, honestly, man, I only know Phil Kessel is the next in line. I don't, I'm going to need hints. I don't, I used to know the list a little bit better when Cogliano yeah. was there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Claude Julien scratched Carl Alsner. I think his streak at the time was pretty high. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, no, I'm so gonna I'm going to give you some clues. I'm going to give you some clues because, yes, Keith Yandel, number one, Phil Kessel at 944 is is number two. And I know you know those two, but then it drops down to 643 games. It's a defenseman. Uh, he um, he just shows up every week. 
and he he kind of plays games like he shoots the puck. <laughs> he often of, and from any angle. Plays games, shoots the puck often and from any angle on yeah. the fence. Yes. He's kind of forgotten about how Brent, good he Brent Burns. You got it, Brent Burns. You ever watch him on defense? All he does is get the puck and shoot. That's all he does. He just gets the puck and he doesn't shoot in shin pads. Yeah, Low. but I don't think. Yeah, and no, I don't think anybody's better at getting shots through though. Oh no, it's one of my favorite things to watch. And you know, not that I'm bringing in my cell playing hockey, but but you know that's how I like. I, I see that and I love that because stuff happened. All right. Uh, so how about this? Keith Yandel, Phil Kessel. Part of their streak was with the Arizona Coyotes, right? Yeah, the number four player has only played for the Arizona Coyotes. Uh, the number four player active That's... only played for the Coyotes, and it's at this is where it drops down to three hundred and thirty-four consecutive games, and that's the fourth longest in the National Hockey League. So, oh yeah, oh yeah. So I think active, but he's only played for one team, so he's a younger guy. Clayton Keller? You got it. Clayton Keller, 334. I can't believe at his age he's on the list. Uh, number five, one of the best players in the world. 325 consecutive games. Ovechkin. Uh, no, not Ovechkin, but yes, he is one of the best players in the world. <laughs> uh, European. Uh, Dreisaitl. You got it. Leon Dreisaitl. And uh, number six, a very underrated goal scorer in the National Hockey League. He plays in the small market. Uh, so that no, not many people realize how good he is scoring goals. He's amazing on the power play. It is small market, good power play guy scores goals. Yes, I think you can get this. Those are good uh, goals. Three hundred and six consecutive games. Matt Zuccarello. Oh, not bad, not bad. But he's uh, he's a bigger market. You, okay, you're considering Minnesota a bigger market. Yeah. Uh, this, this is a very small market. Very small market. Very small market. Very small market. Uh, north, north Kyle of the, Connor. North, you got it, Kyle Connor. North of the border, uh, Kyle Connor. Two guesses. That's it. So that's three hundred six. That's your top six uh, Ironman. Uh, the uh, Montreal Canadiens Ironman is uh, Nick Suzuki. Thirteenth active Nick Suzuki at one hundred seventy one. COVID's ruined everything. Yeah, David Savard, I think, was on a uh, on a roll, yeah, too. I know. All right, Sean, uh, I think you're going to like and nail down my pop quiz for you. Okay. I am asking you, and there's a reason for it. I'll get to the reason a little bit later. Uh, the top five defensemen in points all time, mm -hmm. Russia. Oh, Russians, uh, top five uh, uh, defensemen in points uh, because Zuboff's number got retired. That's the reason why. Uh, and he's so, number two. Yeah. Uh, Gonchar. Number one. Uh, so Gonchar, let's go. Um, now, defenseman, longevity, point producer. Uh, where's Markov on that list? He has about number 600. Three. Number three. So he's at, what, what's his point total? Six? Uh, oh, you don't have it in front of you? Okay. I know I had it somewhere. Hold okay. on. Okay. It gives me a... It, because it gives me the realm of uh, of like the point totals. Uh, what about Fatisov? I did he? No, not no. Fatisov. He didn't. He didn't. Uh, Fatisov. Not Fatisov. <laughs> and uh, where's your boy Markov at uh, five hundred and seventy-two points? Okay, so yeah, I was thinking. So it's someone in the five hundred point range. Um, yeah, Gonchar and Zubov. They're two defensemen that get forgotten about like so often. And I love that they that they're retiring uh, Zuboff. Um, so Russian defenseman. Uh, and and your other two, uh, one of them's in the four hundreds, and one of them is in the three hundreds. Okay. Four hundreds and three hundreds. Russian defenseman. Uh, they're both retired, right? Yes, both are Sean from more our era of the nineties. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think. Power play guys. On the blue line, uh, our era. Oh, Malikov. Malikov is five. Yeah. So now you're just missing four. Four. So about 400 points in the National Hockey League. Uh, can you give me um, a reference point towards a team or towards a... Um, uh, from he's not multiple? known best for, but did play with the Atlanta Thrashers. Okay. Played for the Thrashers. 
He played. Oh, for the uh, Zitnik. Zitnik. Yes. 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 Zitnik. Yes. Zitnik. Okay. I got it. There you go. You give me the Thrashers. I got it. There you go. Okay. Boom. Okay. I think, I think they went out and got him because they knew they were going to the playoffs yeah. and uh, gave up a lot and then got swept. Um, he was in the Stanley Cup final, I believe, with Buffalo when they lost mm-hmm. to Dallas. But with the Islanders, too. I, I always liked the Let's see. Zitnik. I'm I'm happy with my answers there. I I, I was able to work through that. I, I I'm like, when's he gonna say Malakoff? He loves bringing up Malakoff. I, he's the greatest player ever to play in the National Hockey League. I'm when like, he, he loves bringing up Markov. And I'm like, three of the five are we're on the Canadians. Let's let's go with this one. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I like that. Yeah, three out of the five for the Canadians. Yeah, people uh, forget about Gonchar. Right? Uh, yeah. If you have a fun pop quiz, feel free to comment below and let us know. We love doing this pop quiz because we do it all the time. This is Mitch and I just sometimes just quiz each other and we just text each other back and forth. <laughs> we just bring it here on the post game pints uh, podcast. All right, Mitch, what do we do now? All right. Well, we thank everybody for listening and uh, remind that if you like what you heard, and even if you don't, click, listen, and subscribe. You can also send us your comments. We appreciate it. And uh, yeah, the Post Game Pines podcast is just happy to be with you every Wednesday. Cheers, Campbell. Cheers. Well, how's that for your entertainment value? They've done their job very, very well. Awesome. No, no, no. Come on. BBF.